If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please check out our YouTube channel page, C Answers TV. That's C A N S W E R S T V. Just type it into the YouTube search box, then click on one of our links for it. Our channel page features 19 playlists on all types of subjects, such as Jehovah's Witnesses with 17 videos. And by the way, these are videos we've produced ourselves. Mormonism, 14 videos. Seventh-day Adventism, 11 videos. Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyites, 14 videos. Nation of Islam, Black Muslims, this is of the Louis Farrakhan type, 20 videos. God-hating atheists, agnostics, and know-it-alls, 18 videos. Darwin's Metaphysical Evolution Religion, 17 videos. UFOs, Ghosts, Magic, Spiritual Warfare, 16 videos. Islam, such as Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, Alawite, Sufis, 54 videos. Roman Catholicism, Idolatry and the Virgin Mary, 71 videos. Anti-Trinitarians, such as the United Pentecostal Church and Church History, 36 videos. Antichrist cults, the New Age and World Religions, 38 videos. Saved by Works, Baptism, Church of Christ, Campbellism, 69 videos. Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, 19 videos. Predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism, 54 videos. End Times, Supernatural Prophecies and Tough Bible Questions, 20 videos, and others. Our videos are free to the viewing public. If you'd like to be immediately notified of our latest uploaded videos, then please subscribe to our C Answers TV YouTube channel. If you have an existing YouTube account, then simply click on the subscribe button at the top of our channel page next to our ministry name, Christian Answers of Austin, Texas. If you don't have a YouTube account, then it is easy to set one up at no cost. Just search YouTube, then the YouTube opening page will appear, and to the left-hand side will be a blue button saying Create Account. Click on that and follow the instructions. And welcome to Christian Answers. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and thank you for being with us today. Today we're doing a very special series of programs on uh, Bible doctrines that uh, are deemed to be unpopular. Now, joining me in this unpopular Bible doctrine series is my very special guest and Director of Pilgrim Publications, Bob L. Ross. Bob, great to have you here, brother. Thank you, Larry. Bob L. Ross is one of the world's leading publishers of the works of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the famous prince of preachers from the 19th century. Now, Bob, for our audience, could you tell us a little bit about Charles Haddon Spurgeon and some of the works you have there with you? Well, Larry, probably most of the people listening to this program may be acquainted with Spurgeon because they would have an interest in Christian things and Spurgeon has been around a long time. But uh, our interest in Spurgeon, of course, is in his uh, sermons and works that 
were published in the 1800s, reprinting those and making them available. They're on the internet now more and more. They're being added to the internet, even many of his books. And of course, they're on CD-ROM. And uh, in many ways, they're getting used in the world. And one of the ways is, is this book here that we just recently did, uh, not too long ago anyway. It's uh, Spanish sermons, Spurgeon in Spanish. And there is a website now a gentleman in Mexico City, a good friend of ours, is translating and putting Spurgeon sermons on the internet in Spanish. And this is one of the first books that's been done, 36 sermons by Spurgeon on the gospel. And this is the uh, Spanish language edition of it. So uh, we're uh, trying to uh, get Spurgeon known not only to the English-speaking world of our generation, but to other languages and in the United States where we have a great uh, population of Spanish-speaking people, we uh, think this book will make a great contribution to helping spread the gospel. Then we have another book, and this is an unusual book. A gentleman read through the entire 3,563 sermons, I think, of Spurgeon's sermons. It took him about seven years to do it, and he collected these quotations, over 5,000 uh, illustrations and uh, quotations from Spurgeon on a variety of subjects. A lot of times people say, wonder what Spurgeon thought of that, what, what his idea was about this particular thing. Well, you can go in here and he's got it indexed. He's got all the quotations referenced. Sometimes you pick up a book of quotations from Spurgeon and they're not referenced. You don't know where it came from. It could have come from John Doe, and you'd never know. But uh, this man has it all referenced where you can find it in the context of the sermons themselves and uh, trace it down if you want to read it in context to see if that indeed was what it sounded like when you read the excerpt. So it's called Exploring the Mind and Heart of the Prince of Preachers, C.H. Spurgeon, put together by uh, Carrie... Allen, Kerry J. Allen, the Baptist pastor from up in Illinois, and uh, this is one of our latest publications here that we uh, are helping. It's, we didn't actually publish this one, but we're helping to distribute this book. So uh, that's a little bit of information about Spurgeon. All right, uh, Bob, and for our audience, anyone that's interested in more on this subject, particularly the uh, works and sermons of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, just call or write our ministry. You'll see those phone numbers and uh, our address will be popping up at the end of the program. Uh, so feel free to call or write. Also, if you'd like to get on our free newsletter mailing list, you can call or write to our ministry, Christian Answers, and uh, you will receive a free subscription to the Christian Answers newsletter whenever it comes out. So that is there for your uh, yours for the asking, basically. Well, with that, we'll begin our program. Unpopular Bible doctrine number 40 is God calls down terrible judgments, disasters, and destruction that many people say goes too far. And then our scripture references here are Genesis chapter 6 and chapter 7, and that, of course, is Noah's flood. How would, how would God dare to wipe out all the people on the planet except for eight people in the ark? That's, that seems to be going too far, some people would say. Exodus chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. Exodus chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. God kills the firstborn of Egypt. I mean, here's some of these are little infants, things of this nature, children. God kills all the firstborn of Egypt. Uh, numbers, chapters uh, number, numbers chapter 21, verses 33 through 35. Uh, they killed the king Og and all his people. Uh, when Moses and them came into the land, uh, they wiped out all the people of this king, Og. Deuteronomy 3, 6. Uh, king Sihon is killed and all his people. That would be men, women, and children. People say, that's terrible. You kill everybody, even the women and children? Joshua chapter 6, verse 21. They utterly destroyed all in the city, men, women, young, old, sheep, ass, all with the edge of the sword. 
Joshua 10, 28, verse 37, 39, 40. They destroyed all that breathed. First or Second Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. You have the situation where Elijah uh, curses these 42 children and these two bears come out as judgment by God and kill these 42 children. How dare God kill all these children? Genesis 19, 24, Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed with fire and brimstone by God. E Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 18, and then chapter 9, verses 6 through 10. No pity by God. He slays old and young, both maids and little children and women. Ezekiel 4, 12 through 13, the Israelites shall eat dung for their iniquities, the, the prophet says. Jeremiah 13, 14, Dash them together. Uh, God will show no, no compassion, no pity, no mercy, no sparing, but he will destroy them all. Jeremiah 19, 3, 7, 9, 15. God plots evil against Jerusalem. People will eat their sons and daughters and their friends. Jeremiah 25, 31 through 33. God will slay from one end of the earth to the other. The dead will be like dung on the earth. Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 19, God greatly curses Nineveh. And people looking at those curses there in, uh, in those verses will say that goes too far. And uh, one more here for the road, jo Judges chapter 16, verses 28 through 30. God allows Samson to die with his enemies. Here's a man who apparently is going to commit suicide and kill a bunch of people in this temple at the same time and at time and God gives them the strength to pull it off. Ezekiel 8:18 8, Therefore will I also deal in fury mine eye shall not spare neither will I have pity and though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice yet will I not hear them. Ezekiel 9:6 through 10 Slay utterly old and young both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth, and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face, and cried, and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine I shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. Ezekiel 4, 12 through 13. And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I will drive them. Jeremiah 25, 31 through 33. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. And uh, it's just one of those elements, Larry, that's related to the uh, sovereign right of God to exercise his judgment whenever and upon whomsoever he uh, chooses or decrees because after all said and done we're all worthy of the judgment of God against our sins and it's a mercy to any of us that God does not consume us all and that we all were punished for our sins I mean if you're sitting out there today and you're thinking oh well uh, God owes me a pardon God owes me a pass 
Uh, there's nothing I've done deserve anything from God. You're just deceiving yourself if that's what you're thinking because we all have sinned. And we all have violated God's law. We're all undeserving. We're all unrighteous. All that is stated out clearly in Scripture. And uh, whatever God does to us as individuals or as nations or as a world, as in the case of the pre-flood world of Noah, when God destroyed all the inhabitants of the earth except Noah and his family, whatever God does is just and consistent with what we deserve. So we have nothing to complain about in this regard. And the idea of objecting to some uh, providential judgment or disaster that might happen to a people. Uh, now, that doesn't always necessarily mean that God is in that as a judgment or as a punishment of some kind. You know, Jesus warned about interpreting it that way. But certainly we deserve all that we get by way of any real judgment that God enacts among mankind. Now, Bob, let me ask you this. If, if it weren't true that God had done all these things, you know, from destroying every last man, woman, and child in these cities to, you know, killing all these, these people in a flood and so forth. Uh, if it weren't true, and God really was too loving and kind to do that, then uh, it would make logical sense uh, to think that he would never send his own son to die a death on a cross in the suffering that we find in the prophecy of Isaiah 53, for instance. Uh, suddenly, if God doesn't do things like this, then it wouldn't make much sense that Jesus would die a death like that for right, our sins. Right. So, uh, actually, uh, because God does do these things, He destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, He wipes out people, He brings judgment and disaster and terrible things on people. It only makes sense then that God could send His only begotten sin, Son into the world, Jesus Christ, right. to pay a sin debt in a horrible bloody death that he suffered on the cross right. uh, that's so, exactly right so uh we can almost see the gospel in a way right in the judgments of god that some people say goes too far because if they say god goes too far here they would have to say god would go too far with his own son jesus right. christ and if that happens then you have no gospel right so that's how important it is on these situations right. now i just want to bring bring one thing out before we move on to our next doctrine I saved this newspaper article a while back. I mentioned Elijah in the in the bears earlier. Uh, that was mentioned in uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. And, uh, you know, it says children, 42 children kill, killed by these, you know, torn to pieces by these two bears because they were mocking the prophet of God. Well, I've got here, this was on the front page of Awesome American Statesman a while back. And it says here, high court spares juvenile offenders. Ruling bars death penalty for those 17 or younger at time of crime. So here you've got pictures of all these, these 17 or younger teenagers, young people that did horrible crimes worthy of death. And uh, they've got them right here on the front page. And when you look at that scripture uh, from some uh, Hebrew scholars looking at that passage about Elisha and the bears, they say that could be young hoodlums. It could be like people like we're seeing here on the front of the, the page. It doesn't necessarily have to be little five-year-old and six-year-old kids. Mm -hmm. It could be people like we're seeing here, and yet people immediately draw the, the, the conclusion that, oh, he's talking about little bitty kids that these bears ripped apart. But no, it really, it could be people like this who've done horrible crimes, and God destroyed them with these bears. So it's just something to keep in mind, because all these murderous individuals here on this newspaper are 17 or younger, and they've done crimes worthy of death, according to the, 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 the system of law that we have. Well, anyway, with that said, uh, let's move on to unpopular doctrine number 41. As you see on your chart there at home, God mocks and insults false religion in a politically incorrect way. Now, you know, we're always told to be nice and polite about 
religions and, and show respect and all that type of stuff. But now let's, and, and, and to a degree we should, but uh, there are times when we have to deal with the situation as the situation calls for. Now let's take a look at the Word of God here and see what we find. Joshua chapter 24 verses 15, 20, and 23. Joshua brings out a choice for people to make. He says, choose you this day. Uh, and talks about putting away strange gods. He uh, basically is talking about, well, you know, you can choose your gods and these strange gods if you want to, but for me and my house, we're going to choose the true and living God. So he acts like, well, these other gods are strange, but, you know, we're going we're gonna to choose the true and living God. Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 9 through 18, false uh, religion is referred to by the prophet of God as wicked abominations. Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 11. Uh, you have a direct command by Moses, death to religious idolaters. Deuteronomy 7, verses 25 through 26. Graven images of gods, that's false gods, are to be burned. They are called abominations, cursed things, and are to be abhorred. Deuteronomy 12, 2 through 3. Destroy false religious locations and their artifacts. 1 Kings 18, 27 through 40, God's prophet Elijah mocks and then kills false religionists at the famous uh, showdown at Mark, Mount Carmel. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 11, false religion is sin, according to that scripture. 1 Chronicles 16, 26, and Psalm 96, verse 5, gods of the nation and people are idols. Ezekiel 6, 9, false religion is like prostitution. Habakkuk 2, 18 through 19, he refers to false religious with their dumb idols. Psalm 106, 35 through 37, and 1 Corinthians 10, 20, heathen religion is actually unto devils, not God. That's what the scripture says. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, false religionists are damned to hell. Revelation chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. False religion is of Satan and is hated by God. You have that right in the reference there. God hates false religion. Uh, and basically that ties into the fact that basically the he heathen are lost. Uh, just because someone ever uh, heard of God or, or, or anything like that, uh, the heathen who do not have the true religion of God as we find in the scriptures, are lost and are damned by God. Ezekiel 33, 8 through 9, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, 1 John 5, 12, John 3, 36, and 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9. Also in Isaiah 44, verses 14 through 20, building a God or making a God out of a, a, a stump of a tree or out of wood and worshiping it and using part of it to warm yourself with fire and using the other part to worship it's uh, isaiah basically says does not this man have a lie in his right hand deuteronomy 12 2 through 3 ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess served their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree and ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire and ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place second kings 21 11 and 12 because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. First Chronicles 16.26 for all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Ezekiel 6, 9. And they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whither they shall be carried captives, because I am broken with their whorish heart, which hath departed from me, and with their eyes, which go a-whoring after their idols, and they shall loathe themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations. Revelation 2, 13 through 15. 
I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Okay, Bob, what we have here now is something that's truly, truly unpopular, because most people in the world do not worship or believe in the true God of the Bible. They don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They don't believe he died for their sins. They don't believe of the God of the Old Testament. They want to believe in all their other weird religions. The Hindus have their gods. The, the Muslims have their, their God, Allah. You got the Baha'is. You got all the different religious faiths out there. And you got all the nominal Christians that sort of believe parts that they want to believe. Uh, but in the end, uh, they don't like the fact that we're saying that God mocks false religion, curses false religion, hates false religion. They say that, no, it shouldn't be that way. All paths lead to God. One religion is as good as another. And ecumenicism, the Roman Catholic Church says we should all come together. And even in their, their Vatican II documents, in Lumen Gentium, it says even atheists can be saved, according to the Roman Catholic Church. So uh, what do you have to say about all this, Bob? Well, that is just one of the modern facades that we have in the, uh, you know, the politically correct world in the category of religion, that we are supposed to recognize the validity of all religions. Now, we recognize the validity of the right for all religions to be in existence and for people to uh, participate in those religions if they please to do so. But when you say, well, one religion is as good as another, that philosophy doesn't work on anything. I mean, uh, you go down in the car lot, one car is as good as another. <laughs> You go out here to buy a piece of meat at the supermarket. One piece of meat is as good as another. Here's one that's been lying there for three or four days, and they got it marked down to $3 a pound. And over here, that same cut of meat yesterday was 7 or $8 a pound today and fresh. One piece is as good as another. Well, buy the $3, three or four-day-old meat. It doesn't work in doctors. One doctor is as good as another doesn't work in medicine, uh, it doesn't work in anything. I mean, uh, just name me any place where that one significant item is as good as another. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, things like uh, both pencils are right, so one of them is good as another. I I'm talking about where that there is a difference in skill, there's a difference in quality, there's a difference and uh, the benefit that comes from something. And in religion, you just can't, it's just too serious a thing to say that, well, just one church or one cult or one sect or one group or one religion is just as good as another one. Now, if they're all no good, that might be so. Mm -hmm. One might be as good as another if none of them are any good. <laughs> but... Uh, if you put this Bible down by other so-called holy books and you tell me that one of those books is just as another, you just don't know what you're talking about. You have no concept of it. So what you have presented here in giving this review is, you might say, a broad brush analysis and in some instances specific analysis where that... Uh, uh, you should not really have anything to do with them so far as accepting them, believing them, and practicing them. Everything should be tested by the Word. As the Word says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this truth, this Word, there is no light in them. Now, it seems to me, Bob, uh, 
along these lines, and you brought out a good point about one doctor, one medicine, things of that nature, the meat. Uh, you know, when people in life, let's say they got a serious lawsuit going on and they, they want to win that lawsuit, is one lawyer as good as the next? Well, you, uh, you, you have no better example of that than the lawyer suits that have been famous here lately. Michael Jackson, you know, changed his lawyer. Mm -hmm. because the first one wasn't good as the last one. <laughs> right, and and then you have key, uh, children uh, that may get sick, and a parent, if he takes that philosophy of, well, one doctor is as good as the next, mm -hmm. and if he really loves his, his child and is really sick, he'll most likely want the best doctor he can find right. to help his child. But then when it comes to religion, people don't seem to care about Just that. any old thing will do. Anything old thing will do. So here they want to save their kid's life uh, but then when it comes to saving their kids' eternal life, suddenly religion is not important. One religion is as good as the next. People and, sometimes just don't want the weight of responsibility of analyzing religion, uh, particular churches or doctrines, to see whether or not these things be so. And we have an instance in the Bible, of course you know it, in the book of Acts where the Chapter Bereans... Chapter 17. And Verse it said 17. these people were more noble than the people at Thessalonica because right. the Bereans read the scriptures, examined the scriptures, whether those things be so. Amen. But there are people that just don't want that responsibility. It's too much weight for them, and they'd rather push it off on someone else and say, well, if I'm wrong on this, it's because I was, that's what they told me. Mm -hmm. That's what they said. That's what the preacher said or whatever. You've got to take individual responsibility out there. You've got to shoulder your own load. In fact, God will hold you responsible right. on Judgment Day. He said every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to call in brother, sister, mother, father, uh, cousin, and, and all that and say, hey, here's the man to blame, not me. Right. You have to answer for what you did. And I think uh, you really put your finger on it, Bob. Uh, people just don't want to take the time or the effort, like those Bereans you mentioned in the book of Acts, to search these things out to see if they're so. They just want to they just want to be lazy and, and just go with the flow of life there, and there, live their there lives. Are, there are a lot of people, Larry, that their Christianity and their church membership and their religion is about like this. They went down and bought them a Bible. Now, they take that Bible to church and Sunday school. They get home, they lay it down. Seven days later, they pick it up again. They go to church, come back, lay the Bible down, go out to work. Seven days later, they come back, pick up the Bible. Right. And uh, they never crack that book to study it. Mm -hmm. They never check to see if what they're doing or hearing or believing or whatever it's consistent with the Word of God. And so often the case is that a lot of houses uh, that I've been in and seen, the Bible's in their house, but then it usually has a TV guide or a newspaper or something else sitting on top of it. <laughs> and it gets kind of buried under things that people are reading more. And there's coffee stains and Coke stains all over the cover. That's right, because that just shows you where people's priorities are. Instead of studying and reading the Word of God, which leads to their eternal life. They're more concerned with watching a sports event on TV. They're more concerned with reading the daily newspaper and what are the special sales going on in the stores. And they'll spend more time doing that or listen to the radio than at any time trying to put a quality time in studying the Word I was in a home one time and there was a beautiful Bible there. And I looked at that Bible and I picked it up and it had a ribbon. And I was going to take the ribbon and, and lift it up. Mm -hmm. And that ribbon was so old <laughs> and so decayed, despite the new look of the Bible, uh -huh. it just crumbled up. <laughs> you touched it. It just crumbled up. Uh, because that Bible, it although it looked there. new, it hadn't been touched <laughs> oh, for all these years. Isn't there an old uh, bluegrass gospel song, uh, Dust on the Bible? Dust like on that. the Bible. <laughs> dust on the Holy Word. That's right. Get yeah. the dust off the Bible and save your poor soul. Amen. So many, but see, that's another uh, uh, device of the devil. He gets people's minds away from the Word of God and into all these things in, in life that are unimportant 
all the things that don't matter. He gets it, gets their minds away from the Word of God so that they waste their lives and waste their time uh, chasing their tails, but so to speak, on, on unimportant items, whether it's football or, or the latest soap opera or whatever it is. They're wasting their time throughout their life until one day, just like that foolish man who was building new barns, you know, thou fool, tonight your soul is required of you. And all of a sudden death comes and it's too late. And they look back at their whole life. The, the word of God's all around them. Churches on every street corner. And they didn't know a thing. Uh, maybe just a very little thing, but hardly a thing of what was important. They had a whole lifetime to check it out. Never bothered. So anyway, with that said, let's go on to our next unpopular Bible doctrine. You'll see it there on the screen. Doctrine number 42, God's logic is unpopular. God gives absolute truth when sinful men want relative truth instead. And our references here to this unpopular doctrine are Luke 6, 46, where Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, where Jesus de declared to those scribes and Pharisees, Look, you're wrong. Uh, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said, and no man comes to the Father except by me. Luke uh, chapter 11, verses 39 and 40, uh, where it basically says, fools, logically, did not God make both the outside and the inside as he's uh, rebuking these guys who are not following the uh, prescription of God's law. Job chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, shall he that contended with the Almighty instruct him? Uh, Proverbs 13, 20, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 15, 21. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. You have John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And you have in, a, in Greek there, ain logos. And logos uh, can also be understood from the Greek as being logic, uh, the word, understanding of language. The word requires logic. And finally, Luke 13, 14 through 17, Sabbath day logic concerning healing. Isaiah 55, 8 through 11. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, okay. so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Proverbs thirteen twenty, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Luke thirteen fourteen through 17 And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, in them therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound below these eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. And now, to bring all this together, as you're looking at these scriptures on the chart, basically, God expects us to use logic. A cannot equal non-A. If I say this, therefore that. And when you read these scriptures, and the ones I've referenced here, you have a logical flow. But what we have in today's society is that everybody wants to make truth relative, 
and it doesn't matter what you believe your truth is your truth and if you want to believe that fine i'll believe what i want to believe uh logic basically is thrown out the door you can there there are no absolutes but when we read the scriptures and particularly these god expects us to know truth from error right from wrong if a then b uh logical flows uh, particularly of uh, this situation in Luke 13, their last scripture reference on your chart, uh, 14 through 17, Jesus gives a logical explanation why he can heal on the Sabbath when these guys saying you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. He says, wait a minute, don't you, don't you pull that donkey out of the ditch <laughs> on the Sabbath if it's in trouble? Why can't I heal? He's making logical arguments why he can heal someone on the, on the Sabbath. And, and logic is throughout God's book because that's a law that God has established in the universe that we find ourselves in. Bob, any comments? Well, I wouldn't go so far to say as one uh, fellow said that God is logic, but uh, or that logic is God. But we do know that the word logic comes from the scripture word logos, which means word. And uh, a word is an expression of a concept and uh, our mental apparatus works in making verbal expressions of concepts that are in our mind and uh, so we know from this that God being an intelligent being we conclude logically that God is certainly logical and the scripture that kept going on over my mind when uh, I was listening to you is that one in Isaiah? Now, you may have even referred to it, but uh, at any rate, I kept thinking about my thoughts are not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Neither are your ways my way, saith the Lord. And what is that is, reference? It's Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now, some people say, oh, let's get together and talk about this. Let's have a meeting of counselors about this. Let's have a meeting of advisors about this. All that is well and good for your normal human affairs. But uh, when it comes to the scripture, uh, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So what do we do? Verse 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So we're shut up to the word of God. As that scripture said that I quoted a while ago. To the word. And to the, te to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. So we're shut up to the thoughts of God. We're shut up to the words of God. And uh, if we're going to talk anything over or counsel about anything or get advice about anything, it better be from people who admire and know and bow to the word of God because that is the ultimate revelation to which we're responsible, to which we're accountable. And I might add, it's the only revelation of pure truth that we have. Now, we can have truth. We can have elements of truth and uh, principles and uh, all those categories of distinction that are truth. But you know what? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. I'm the truth. So if we don't start with Jesus Christ at the foundation, and if we don't cap it off with Jesus Christ, we are not going to arrive at the truth. Uh, that's just the way it works. That's just the way the Bible instructs us. Submit your way unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord. Give it all to him and he will bring it to pass. He will work it out. He will make it clear. And uh, so logic, certainly the logic of God is not popular 
because his ways are not our ways. That's right. And now, let me ask you this, Bob. Now, you have a lot of people that will say, well, that's just your interpretation. You, you, have a, you come up with a Bible passage, and you interpret it a certain way. And let's say I'm a Mormon of the Mormon church, and, and I say I'm going to become a god of my own planet. And so I can look at, you know, Psalm 82, for instance, ye are gods, and say, hey, the Bible says that, you know, there's going to be gods, and, and I, I'll get to be my own god of my own planet someday, uh, things of that nature. Uh, your interpretation, and if I take a passage like, Judas went out and hung himself, and then I take another passage from somewhere else, and I say, go thou and do likewise. Can I logically infer from that that I should go out and hang myself like Judas, based on those two fragments of verses? Uh, does logic play a part in, oh, that's just your interpretation? And does logic play a part in, well, if I take Judas hanged himself, go thou and do likewise? Does that, does that play a part in understanding what the truth of God is? It is true that everything we believe about the Bible is an interpretation. And as an individual, as I comprehend it, as I read it and understand it, I do come to an interpretation. But for someone to simply fend off a teaching, an obvious truth, or something by saying, oh, that's your interpretation, and by that they imply that because it is interpretation, it can't be true, then they are committing a very serious uh, fault of use of logic themselves. A logical fallacy. Right, because everything has to be interpreted, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a musical note or uh, a uh, mathematical uh, calculation of some sort, whatever. It's going to have an interpretation, and that's true of language. And this Bible is written in language with words and terms. And uh, well, see, we, without logic, you can't have real right. communication. To interpret words, you have to have the the laws of logic right. in play to be able to make an interpretation or an understanding. But generally, when when people have said that's just your interpretation. What their meaning is, uh, well, that's what you believe about it, but I don't believe it. I don't accept it. And uh, they're not really analyzing the situation fairly and squarely and objectively. Mm -hmm. They're just not approaching it that way. That's right. So it comes down to a logical understanding, a logical understanding of the Word of God through normal communication. I mean, people pick up a newspaper and they read the daily news or they pick up a novel, they read the book and understand it. Well, you can pick up a Bible and it's written in language you can understand. It's written in uh, a communicative style that if you just read it and read it in context and using your laws of logic, it will make sense and the truth comes out. So when someone says, oh, you're supposed to go commit suicide because it says in one passage, Judas went out and hanged himself. In another passage, it says, go thou and do likewise. We know logically that that's not follow. That's a non secular. That's a logical fallacy. Uh, there's, there's many logical fallacies out there uh, from ad hominem to uh, the, to the different you know, card stacking to just a whole bunch of logical fallacies that uh, once we understand those, we, it aids us in interpretation. But the, the, the bottom line is uh, when you check the Bible in context using the laws of logic, you realize that the Bible is not saying for us to go out and commit suicide, to go out and hang ourselves like Judas. Because if you read those passages, just like you read a, a newspaper, you'll never come to the, that conclusion because the communication of the style of the writing of the Bible will make that clear to you. So that's why logic is so important. Logic is part of our reality and it must be used. And so often when people have false religious ideas, false concepts, it's because they are violating the laws of logic and communication to where that gets distorted and they end up with all these crazy ideas because they're not following the rules of the game established by the divine rule giver, God. Okay, with that, let's move on to our next unpopular doctrine. That would be unpopular doctrine, and now in these days and age, this is really unpopular and getting even more unpopular. Heck, 
Bob, we might get it thrown in jail someday for this one, but that's life. Uh, on popular doctrine number 43, homosexuality, lesbianism, and bestiality are condemned by God. And as the people can see this at home on their chart, I'm going to run through some scripture references. And uh, here we go. Deuteronomy 22.5. No cross-dressing allowed. In other words, men are not supposed to wear women's clothes, and uh, uh, men are not supposed to wear women's clothes. So that's forbidden by God according to the law of Moses. 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 11 through 12. King Asa removed all the sodomites and was commended by, commended by God for that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, abusers of themselves with mankind are listed in the category of sins against God. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32, homosexuals and lesbians are condemned uh, there in that reference. Second, in fact, I was, at a, uh, I was speaking out of the UT campus one day, and this guy was asking about uh, whether the Bible condemned homosexuality. And all I did was read that passage, Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32. I just read it. I didn't give any interpretation or anything else. And he got so mad, he just stomped off. So he got the, he got the meaning of that passage, <laughs> and he didn't like it. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 7 uh, Josiah breaks down houses of the Sodomites uh, and was commended by God. First Kings 22, verses 46, Asa took Sodomites out of the land. Deuteronomy 23, 17, no Sodomites are allowed of the sons of Israel. Leviticus 18, 22, do not lie with mankind, no homosexuality allowed. Uh, Leviticus 20, verse 13, homosexuals are to be put to death under the Mosaic Law, Leviticus 18, verse 23, no sex with animals. Now, it's interesting there, if the viewers are seeing these verses, you'll notice I just mentioned Leviticus uh, chapter 18, verse 22, which talks about no homosexuality. The very next verse in Leviticus chapter 18, the very next verse after no homosexuality is no sex with animals. So bestiality is condemned right after homosexuality. Okay, Exodus 22, 19, uh, death for those having sex with animals. Leviticus 20, verse 15, the man and animal are both to be killed. Deuteronomy 27, verse 21, cursed are they that lie with animals. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, homosexuals are called ungodly and sinners. And of course, we can't forget about what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 19 is particularly when the sodomites were trying to break into lot's house and get after those angels uh, it's pretty obvious what was happening there deuteronomy 22 5 the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are abomination unto the lord thy god romans 1 24 through 32 Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, 
who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Leviticus 20.13, If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. Exodus 22.19, Whosoever lieth with a beast shall surely be put to death. Okay, Bob. Uh... I just went over these very unpopular doctrines in our day and age. We have all these, we have a metropolitan churches, which are homosexual churches. Uh, people say God's too loving to, you know, these are antiquated and outdated ideas. We've kind of touched on this kind of stuff before when we dealt with women pastors, but uh, uh, people are, are now saying that you should have homosexual marriages. It should be ordained by law. They should get health insurance for this. Uh, all, these, all this homosexuality, lesbianism, and of course the bestiality that we have in there, uh, it all seems to uh, be the politically correct thing to, to go with today. Uh, what are your comments on this? Well, you know, this thing that uh, we have today that is in the area of politics and some of the churches even, and uh, various uh, categories of society there's just nothing good that we can foresee coming from this particular practice and certainly how anyone could try to justify this kind of behavior from the word of God is inexplicable because uh, over and over again we are warned and uh, you know it just seems to me that common sense would dictate to these folks that what they're doing leads to death because just look at all the the uh, mass of consequences at least what appears to be consequences of practicing this particular lifestyle and uh, I baptized a gentleman years ago and uh, in a northern state and he was a professed Christian married had a family I recall maybe at least two young daughters and maybe a son. And, uh, well, something along the way, I, I don't know when it happened or what triggered it, but he got involved in the early stages of the, uh, uh, what was that movement up in New York, that nightclub that was popular with the... Uh, gays and lesbian oh, people uh, up there. Uh, uh, I think I know what you're talking about. Some famous discotheque or yeah, something like that the up disco there. disco movement. He was Studio involved. 54. Yeah, I think that was it. Well, I can't remember the name of it, but it was very famous. And being a musician, he almost had a, uh, you might say, a ticket into that uh, situation. He was very good as a musician. And uh, he got involved in that, and uh, that was when it was the most rampant forms of of uh, sexual misconduct or sexual aberrations or sexual abnormalities or whatever you want to call it uh, irregular sex practices of those days and uh, they didn't know what AIDS was then mm -hmm. they didn't know well uh, of course he got AIDS mm -hmm. and he died eventually he died this was right when the AIDS epidemic was starting. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of his daughters went on to be a, uh, well, an accomplished, successful actress to some degree. And uh, the other daughter wrote a book talking about her father, telling about these things. And the mother's a devoted Christian. But it's just a very sad thing for me as an individual being close to this family like I was at one time at least, close enough that we stayed in our home and I baptized him. and It's just a sad, sad thing. And uh, to me, when, when you talk about these kind of sexual, this kind of sexual behavior, that's what I think about, the sadness, mm -hmm. the death, the families that are destroyed, the children that are affected, 
by all this and uh, why they can't see that that's the ultimate result of it and have that work on them to repent of their sin and trust in Christ it's just beyond me Larry right and it just shows the, the, the point of the matter that uh, men when they get away from the laws of God a, a personal relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and and because Jesus said if a man loves me he will keep my commandments and my father will love him Jesus said uh, but the problem is people start getting into idolatry which in this case could be sex uh, perverted sex of one thing or another and they're and they're they're putting God out of their minds and pursuing this form of idolatry uh, to bring themselves to, to where they're really more lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. We'll be back again uh, for our next program. So join us for that. In the meantime, I'm Larry Wessels with Christian Answers. Bob L. Ross. Bob, thanks for being with us at Pilgrim it. Publications. And we'll see you next time. And remember, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, Jesus said. So through Jesus Christ is the way of salvation unto the eternal God. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -E -S -E in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the Jesus in